and welcome. Today's webinar, and we will have Dr. Diane Bassett um, be presenting on our Back to School webinar on Transition 101, what special educators, VR counselors, and those who want to update their practice. Um, and right at this time, I'm going to stop sharing. And Diane, if you would like to share your um, um, PowerPoint, and we'll roll from there. Okay. Am I on? You are on. Awesome. Well, welcome everyone. Welcome back to school. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you happen to be. If you're eating your lunch or if you are multitasking while you're listening to this, I welcome you to this seminar that we are having. One hour only, probably the fastest time I've ever spent in talking about uh, both the history of transition as well as what we're doing today and how that affects you as a professional. So thank you so much for attending. And if you do have questions, make sure that you type them in. Uh, we received a lot of questions and I will tell you that if I had to answer all of those questions right now, we'd be here until Christmas. So we're not going to do that. Um, at this particular moment, but what I would do is I would encourage you to go to the NTACT website and particularly to go to the link that is on the homepage that shows the Capacity Building Institute and go in there because all of the presentations that were at the CBI are on there and a lot of the things that you asked about assessment, cultural considerations, family engagement, uh, WIOA, lots of WIOA are all there uh, just waiting for you to look at them. So please consider doing that if you will. Uh, I think it would answer a lot of your questions and uh, in fact, that's what we're here for. So, so let's get started. Um, today's seminar, if you will, is, are going, is going to cover a variety of things. And so what we're going to talk about are what are transition services, a little tiny bit about the history of transition, so you'll know from whence we came. We're going to spend some time on the four laws that govern transition services, including IDEA, Section 504, ADA, and WIOA. We're going to talk briefly about the state performance plan indicators and um, our role within that. Uh, then we'll go to the transition planning process. And then we'll uh, finalize this whole thing with a bit on self-determination and family engagement and cultural considerations, all of which are full courses or degrees among themselves. So please know that this is the quick and the dirty and the general. I can't get too much into the weeds on all of this and I'm sure that you understand that. So let's get going here. Oops, it's not going for me. Um, if... Oh, there you go. I got it. All right, so many times we ask students, typical students, students with disabilities, what do you wanna be when you grow up? We probably start this when they are very small. You say, I want to be an astronaut or a teacher, or I want to drive a big truck. Um, but very seldom do they say, when I grow up, I want to earn minimum wage. I really want to live in poverty. I want to further my education in prison. I want to make sure I have absolutely no health insurance. I want to keep those social services in my life. And if I'm lucky, I want to be homeless. I haven't heard any of these in the many years that I've worked with students. And that made me go back and think about what, are, what is the future for many of the students that we serve. And I will tell you that in my past history, before we get to this, I was a general educator before I was a special educator, before I was a professor in higher education. So I've kind of done it all in that regard. Um, so I've seen sort of both sides of the coin in terms of outcomes for students. Currently I'm working in eight high poverty high schools, working more with teachers than with students, but still I have an opportunity to still have a lot of uh, dialogue and discussion 
with the students who are there. It's been very enlightening for me to go back and do this. All right, so for each 100 students without disabilities leaving school, those typical students, 58 of them will get a permanent paid job right away. And a year later, 70 or 70% 70 will have a paid permanent job. And throughout adulthood, 82% will continue to work in a permanent paid job. Not so much for students with disabilities. Upon leaving school, 28% of them will get a permanent paid job right away. A year later, 10 more will, up to 38%. And then it dips down a little bit. Throughout adulthood, 30 will continue to work in a paid permanent job, 30% versus 70%. We can see that these statistics are strikingly different. And that has changed a little over the years, but it still is woefully under what we want to have happen. According to the National Institute on Disability, here are some statistics that they came up with in their 2016 disability research report. There's an earnings disparity of over $10,000 in median earnings between those with and without disabilities since the year 2008. And it actually has increased, according to them, in magnitude. States all would also vary widely in earnings gaps. Smallest being in Nevada with about $4,500 to a high of $24,000 in the District of Columbia. More than one in five US residents with disabilities of working age were living in poverty. The national poverty rate is about 14%, so roughly double that can be accorded to people, adults living with disabilities. And the poverty percentage gap has been between 7.4 and 8.3 percentage points across the past seven years. So what does this mean? Well, clearly we have a lot of work to do. Um, there's a brutal reality here that even though we've been working in transition um, services for the last 30, 40 years, we still are not doing enough to help bridge this disparity gap. Um, so let's talk about how this all started. Back in the late 70s, early 80s, and I started teaching in the early 70s, and when I was teaching, I first started as a high school English teacher and then I sort of graduated into special education because I was very curious about why I couldn't do a better job teaching certain students that I knew it was my problem that I couldn't teach them, not their problem that they couldn't learn. But we all started really looking at why our students could succeed perhaps in school but getting out of school, they had woeful outcomes. That was certainly true for me. I was making two to three years growth per year in reading, writing, and math with my students. And then they were graduating and they were unemployed. They were underemployed. Many of the young female students that I had uh, ended up married early or pregnant or, and or underemployed, unemployed. Uh, I had a number of students who died in that period, whether from accidents or drugs or suicide. The outcomes were horrific. And I, for one, could not figure out why this was going on, other than the fact that I have not prepared them for real life. And indeed, that's what happened. The students came back to us and they said, you know, yeah, you taught me to read, but you didn't teach me what to do with that reading. You know, you didn't tell me how to apply for jobs. You didn't tell me, I can't, I don't know what a checkbook is. I don't know how to do that. I need to get out a loan to be able to purchase a car. Those were things that we never taught students. Those very important life skills that we had to coalesce with the academics. I was not the only one thinking about this. There were many, many of us across the country, believe it or not, who were all coming to the same conclusion. 
And in fact, in the 80s, the Office of Special Education Programs began to fund policies and grants to explore transition services. A woman named Madeline Will, perhaps you've heard her name, she was the Assistant Secretary of Special Education at the time, and she came up with a document called Bridges to Work, in which we, she really talked about, uh, as, as articulated also by Andrew Halpern, what are transition services and why are they so important for us? So going back into the 80s, we first started having these discussions. States across the country also started dealing with this issue. And they started saying, we really need to think about how to best help our students with disabilities when they exit high school or secondary school. And so in 1990, the, the uh, reauthorization of IDEA at that point mandated the inclusion of transition services into its reauthorization. And it's been with us ever since. As of 2004, as most of you know, we keep having reauthorization after reauthorization, after reauthorization of IDEA. But IDEA expanded the definition of transition services to include a variety of other things that we'll be talking about in a little bit. The three principles of transition services before we get too far into the details are, are fairly comprehensive in their general nature. You know, that sounds weird, but bear with me. First, transition is results oriented. The transition requirements of IDA have shifted to a focus on a results oriented um, approach at the IEP documents. What this means is that anything that we write onto an IEP that has a transition focus to it will be able to be measurable and will be able to be doable. This is a direct result, and we'll talk about this in a minute, of a lot of the standards and accountability systems that have come into place. Before I can remember writing transition plans that were one page long. Ha, you guys are all laughing, but it's really true. The last transition focused IEP that I worked on with the Colorado Department of Ed, which is where I live, uh, was over 30 pages long. So times have drastically changed. So transition is results oriented. Number two, transition is student centered. Before it was what we were doing to students, not what we were doing with students. And the push now is to involve students in every aspect of the transition planning process. I will die a happy woman if I can know that every student can lead all or part of his or her IEP. And so far we're working toward that, but we haven't gotten there. Some of you who work with students with very significant needs say, I don't think so, but honestly, if you take a look at some of Jim Martin's work and others' work, Mike Waymeyer's work, you will see that it really is possible for students to have a huge part in um, being a part of their transition services. And third, transition is a coordinated effort. What we try to do is coordinate the student, the family, the school personnel, the agency personnel, the families, all of that into a workable system that benefits the student. And this is articulated through a transition focused IEP. All right, so here's what we know about transition at this point. And we've known these things for a very long time, quite frankly. Youth with disabilities who have transition plans are able to achieve their goals more successfully. This one, the second one, has been around for quite a while. Youth with disabilities who are competitively employed in high school have a significantly higher employment rate after they graduate from high school. Youth with disabilities who have opportunities to use self-advocacy skills are better prepared for further education and employment. And as a uh, 
university professor who is also on our advisory board for our disability support office, I can tell you that those students who came in and were able to articulate their needs, their challenges, their strengths, were far more successful in how they performed as college students. And finally, youth with disabilities need strong literacy and math skills if they are to succeed in adult life. You don't have to tell me, a former English teacher, that students need as many reading, writing, and oral language skills in order to be able to succeed. So we do not throw the baby out with the bathwater here, but we integrate. Okay, let's take a look at the 2004 definition of transition. And Deanne, I, it's hard for me to see part of that screen, so I'm just gonna pretend that I've memorized this a million times. So I would like you, as you're looking at this slide, to look at words that I have in red and we're going to talk about each of those words as we go through them. So here we go. I'm actually going to read off the slide. The term transition services means a coordinated set of activities for a child with a disability that is designed within a results-oriented process, focused on, focused on improving the academic and functional achievement of the child with a disability to facilitate the child's movement from school to post-school activities, including the following, post-secondary ed, vocational ed, integrated employment, including, including supported employment, continuing in adult ed, adult services, independent living, and or community participation. A long definition, but a very comprehensive definition. Let's break this down a little bit. Transition services. These are the services that we give that provide the activities, the opportunities, and the mandated assistance that compels us to provide the breadth of opportunities that students can have within a coordinated set of activities. And I want you to underline this, highlight this, Put this into your brain as much as you can, the coordination part, because this is perhaps the most difficult part of providing transition services. Just as we know we're siloed in schools and that sometimes we are not the best communicators with each other, planning a very comprehensive coordinated set of activities takes work. For example, I might have a student um, as a transition, as a special education teacher for whom my responsibility is to write a uh, transition focused IEP. And Jason tells me that he really wants to go into theater. Great, so we're going to write some post secondary goals for that. Unbeknownst to me, his family is saying, but what we really want Jason to do is to go to school to become a vet tech, to which I haven't heard that before, to which uh, a VR counselor has come in and said, but wait, what I really have heard is that we want to get him involved to go and get his general education courses in a community college and be able to go and work in food service industry. And so coming together with all of those things is really difficult. How do we mesh those different opportunities for that student in a way that is coordinated for Jason. And sometimes that works really well and sometimes not so well. So as you're writing your transition focused IEP, remember that every single component from every single person, including the student who is a part of that meeting, has to all fit together. Moving right along, a results-oriented process. These words did not used to be in the definition of transition services, but they were added in the, between 1990 and 2004 with the advent of, wait for it, standards-based education, uh, large-scale accountability systems, including assessments, 
that asked for measurable results. And so when we say results-oriented process, it's not just, sorry to say, results for the student, it's also results for the school, for the district, that we can show that we have made measurable progress for the students that we serve. That's a very important point. Focused on improving both the academic and functional. In other words, the academic skills as well as those uh, skills of daily living, uh, community-based skills, all of those things. Don't you wish that we could have all students that we serve uh, have, have this mandate to have both academic and functional skills? I work with a lot of typical students now too they don't have these functional skills, they need them desperately. So another discussion for another time. And finally, to facilitate the child's movement from school to post-school activities. Meaning that what we want to do is to provide a seamless, if at all possible, movement for that particular young adult from high school into the next phase of a student's life into a young adult's life. We know, those of us who have had teenagers, as I have had, now I have an adult uh, son, but we know that this is fraught with a lot of change. Will students change their mind a million times? I hope so. Will they come up with other hopes and dreams? I hope so. I hope that they, that they experiment and that they fail and that you're right there with that safety net to help them out, as are their families. But we are there to provide that support for them as they go through their own journeys. Okay, so that is the definition of transition by law, the mandate that we all have. It's a beautiful definition as far as I'm concerned. Transition services are based on the individual child's strengths, preferences, interests, and they include the following things, and there are a lot of them. Instruction-related services, community experiences, development and employment skills, and other post-school adult living objectives, and when appropriate, and that should read when always appropriate, acquisition of daily living skills and a functional vocational evaluation. Here are some pieces of um, the transition services section in the 2004 uh, IDEA that you should just be aware of. First, transition objectives must be incorporated in IEPs for students 16 and older. Now, some of you live in states that that age has been lowered to 14. Raise your hand if you live in a state where it's 14 or give a shout out or something. I'm very jealous. In Colorado, we start at 15 for that. Um, and I really do believe that 14 is the best age. Why? Well, because the highest rate of dropouts is in ninth grade, not in 12th grade, not in 10th grade, it's ninth grade that freshman year of high school. If we can catch kids and help to show them what a great future they can have, we really have um, provided a, a great impetus for them to stay in school. So, but if you have a state that starts with 16, you can still start doing some pre-transition activities with your middle school and freshman students. The IEP, as we said, must include instruction and community experiences. And the IEP, the transition-focused IEP, the objectives within that, must reflect both academic and functional skills. Parents must be notified that transition goals and objectives will be discussed during the IEP meeting. And equally important, students must be invited to the IEP meeting. They do not have to attend, but they must be invited to the meeting, and we must show documentation of that. If a student doesn't attend his or her IEP meeting, then his or her interests and preferences 
must be considered and documentation of this is required. This does not mean that 10 minutes before the IEP meeting, you go up to Susie and say, Susie, so like, what do you want to do when you grow up? Oh, you want to be an astronaut? Okay, great. And where do you want to live? Ah, oh, you want to live with your girlfriends in an apartment. Got it. Okay, and what do you want to do in your leisure time? You want to party. Awesome. Okay, this does not <laughs> provide the kind of documentation that we need. It needs to be done in um, a much deeper fashion than that and shared. But what our hope is, is that even if a student does not uh, help to lead or guide his or her IEP meeting, that at least the student will attend. And the student will be allowed to speak. I have been in many, many IEP meetings where it's like 95-5. 95% of the time, the adults are talking. 5% of the time, the student is talking. Raise your hand again if you have seen this. If you have, then you know that we need to change this. And finally, relevant agencies, when appropriate, must be invited to the IEP meeting. Okay, that's enough of a, a very basic overview of transition services as written within IDEA. Let's talk about three other laws that are also a part of, um, of the transition services system. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, the Americans with Disabilities Amendments Act, which started in 1990, and finally the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. Let's start with Section 504 first. So Section 504 was written as a civil rights law. It was not written as a disability law. It was written to protect individuals from discrimination back in 1973. Remember that we're still talking about you know, through the 60s and into the 70s, we're talking about civil rights a lot. And we're talking about uh, as, that's the Johnson era, the Lyndon Johnson era. We are thick into the Vietnam War, and Lyndon Johnson is also very, very much working on the war on poverty. He's giving lots and lots of money to social prob problems, and civil rights is a really, really big deal to him. Uh, even though we don't know it in many ways, Lyndon Johnson was one of our most prescient presidents, and he suffered for it. He served one two term, left office, and died within a couple of years. Such was the stress that he endured. But he left with us this legacy of the Rehabilitation Act. Today, there are two real purposes for Section 504. So let's go through them. First, it is used for students in public schools who do not qualify under IDEA. They have perhaps been assessed and found that they do not meet the criteria that have been set forth. Uh, for example, learning disabilities, ADHD, uh, certain physical or other health impairments, uh, emotional uh, disabilities. Those might be very good candidates for a student who would not qualify under IDEA as having an identifiable disability. So we'll talk about what we do with that in a second but we, we have some remedies to continue to help students. Section 504, and this is back in 1973, remember, is mandated for entities, for all entities, organizations that receive federal funds. So if you're a public school district, or if you're working in a public school district, do they receive federal funds? Absolutely. If you're a public university, do they receive federal funds? Absolutely. They receive federal funds for scholarships. They receive federal funds perhaps um, for grants, for everything from capital improvements, building buildings, to 
uh, grants that professors get, those of us who have written and received grants. Uh, if you're a private school and you receive federal funds, perhaps to help with scholarships or to, perhaps to help uh, with grants to help on a particular initiative, particular initiative, you are receiving federal funds, you are now under the responsibility of Section 504. If you're a private university, the same thing. So pretty much every single entity in this country, if they receive a dime of federal funds, they must comply with the requirements of Section 504. I told you that Section 504 seeks to guarantee non-discrimination against persons with disabilities. But what I didn't mention is that there's no funding attached to do this. Section 504 is what we call an unfunded mandate, meaning that when it was passed, there was no money attached to it. IDEA is very different from that. IDEA is an entitlement act that has funding that is attached to it. And that's a very, very different thing. The funding that is attached to it from IDEA flows from the federal government that's matched with state monies, which is then also matched with local monies. Not so, not so for Section 504. So where does that money come from? It comes from within the budgets of the entities that I described to you. So it might be a line item in a school district's budget. It, might, it is a line item in universities' budgets. Uh, for, since 1973, they've had line items for Section 504 within the budget constraints of universities and colleges. And that has proven to be um, somewhat contentious. We'll talk about that in a minute. But it's really important that you understand that the monies that come from Section 504 have to be coming from within that particular entity. 504 in schools provide a 504 plan for students. And what's, what's interesting to me about this plan, and also what's mandated about this plan, is that it involves no special educators. It's not supposed to. If you're a special educator, you're not supposed to be involved in this. You can give some advice, but no services. And so if you're giving services, you may want to write a big question mark somewhere because this is not within your funding purview to be providing these services. But you can provide your good advice if that's something that you feel is necessary. The responsibility of 504 plans is up to general education staff and it is to provide adaptations and modifications within the general education setting. So what might this include? This might include things like, uh, and we're all familiar with these, seating a student closer to a teacher's desk, or providing the notes if you're a history teacher to a student so that that student can follow along with that, or allowing the student to take you as you're giving a lecture or something like that. Uh, it could be that uh, a student has a health concern. And so you might say, well, I'll give you extended time on tests. And you can do that as a general educator. You can make those kinds of decisions, provided that it's part of the plan. I'll give you an example that's very near and dear to my heart right now. I have a goddaughter who's 15 who has um, incredible difficulties with uh, her colon right now, to the point that in a month, she's going to go in and have her entire large intestine removed. It's a very major surgery. It's not just one surgery, it's more than one surgery. She's a straight A student, she's a volleyball player, she's everybody's favorite child, and here she goes into this giant thing. What her mother has done and father is they have gone to the school district and they've worked out a 504 plan already. It's very interesting. They have allowed her to speed up her uh, 
the work that she's doing within the curriculum so that by November, it's actually November when this is going to happen, uh, she will have completed her, her first semester of work. She will then have her surgery and it will take a couple of months and then they will allow her to catch up so that by the end of the second semester, she will be on par with her peers. I think this is an amazing, amazing set of accommodations and modifications that they're doing for this fine young woman. Um, I know they all love her, and so it's pretty easy for them to, to make these accommodations for her. But that's just one example of what a 504 plan can do. In post-secondary settings, it's a little bit different. When you leave, even if you have an IEP, uh, and you have an identified disability and you go to a post-secondary setting, it's no guarantee that you're going to receive the kinds of services that you wish. That, by the way, are covered under Section 504 and the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, you are then, you then have to show your eligibility for that. You are no longer entitled to those services. Section 504 in post-secondary settings provides the funds that if you are deemed eligible from the documentation that you bring with you, then certain accommodations and modifications you do can be yours, such as extended time on tests, taking tests in a different setting, um, having a note taker, uh, perhaps having no curriculum modifications. That's not part of this whole thing but um, having uh, extra help from either a tutorial staff, or maybe the, the professor would agree to do that. Uh, there are so many different kinds of adaptations and modifications that each disability service center has to offer, all covered under the aegis of Section 504 and ADA. So do you see the difference? We'll talk about that in a minute again. Let's go to the Americans with Disabilities Act, our giant umbrella of disability for all of us, for all of us. Uh, it's intended for all of us from birth to death, from womb to tomb, as I love to say. And it too is an anti-discrimination act. It seeks to end discrimination in both the community and the workplace. Here again, in 1990, it became an unfunded mandate. There's no funding source to fund any of the different areas that ADA covers, neither communication, nor transportation, nor workplace, nor barrier-free access. None of that is covered. It has to be covered by the entities under which ADA falls or which uh, ADA is the umbrella under which all of these entities are housed. So this was the last unfunded mandate um, ever to be passed in Congress. Some of you may remember Newt Gingrich. He was the one who thundered back then, no more unfunded mandates. And indeed, that has not happened. So a little point of trivia for you. ADA seeks barrier-free access everywhere in restaurants, malls, apartments. If I go over to Mile High Stadium to watch the Broncos, there must be barrier free access at all levels of the stadium. And that's true uh, at our Pepsi Center when we watch basketball games. Barrier free access at all levels. Barrier free access in malls. Barrier free access in restaurants. Even if they're more than one story, there must be um, an elevator, barrier-free access in schools. And some of you may work in schools where you've had to add some of that barrier-free access, particularly in old schools. Our son went to an elementary school that was, the building was over a hundred years old. And right down through the center of it was a $80,000 uh, elevator that had been put in. The workplace must provide reasonable accommodations and all public transportation must be accessible. This does not mean all buses must be accessible or all subways or all trains 
but a percentage of those buses, of those uh, trains, of those subway cars. I mean, it used to be 14%, I'm not sure what it is today. Telephone systems must be accessible to those who have hearing impairments or who are deaf, and that equal opportunity must be given to individuals with disabilities. I will tell you right now that under the Dis Americans with Disabilities Act, there is no one uh, disability police. So if uh, someone if someone who is hard of hearing feels like they are have not been treated fairly and that they need reasonable accommodation and accessibility to a communication system, they would go and grieve to the FCC. If someone felt that they had been discriminated against in the workplace, they would go to the Department of Labor and so on and so forth. It's a very unwieldy system that way. So here we go. What are the differences in the legal responsibility between secondary school and post-secondary education? We'll take a look, and I've already identified most of this. In secondary school, free appropriate public education, but not in post-secondary. There is no such thing as a free appropriate public education. IDEA is an entitlement law. Section 504 and ADA are eligibility acts. IEPs are required in secondary, uh, secondary schools. But in post-secondary, the students must self-identify and they have to provide the documentation that says, hey, I have this particular disability and I need these particular services. And there still is not a guarantee that they will receive those services. At the secondary school level, um, we involve parents or guardians, but not at the post-secondary level. Any of you who have had children go through the college system know that FERPA is really a big deal. The Family Educational Rights and Protection Act, that it protects students, young adults, with their own privacy. Uh, as parents, there are ways that we can ask our students to opt out of that, but that's a whole different lecture for a different time. Okay, and um, under secondary, IDEA modifies and accommodate instruction and behavior insofar as it impedes academic progress. That's the whole point of special education. It, it impedes academic progress. For college students, not so much. It does impede academic progress, but it's their responsibility to go and to um, to make sure that they're receiving the services that they desire. And sometimes that won't even happen, depending a lot on budget more than anything else. Okay, let's talk about the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. This is um, really a reauthorization of the Vocational Rehabilitation Act. And the great thing about this particular act is that it increases services to youth with disabilities within public school systems. And I'm going to turn the next two slides over to Ronica, who is our expert on this. Uh, my understanding is that she's just completed her doctorate um, in this very area. And so Ronica, take it away, my dear. Oh, thank you, Diane. Um, you are far too kind for that. <laughs> Um, so, yes, um, I'm just going to, you know, briefly touch on um, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunities Act, um, otherwise known as WIOA, otherwise known as WIOA. <laughs> and um, as Diane just said, this is a reauthorization um, to what was previously um, WIA, W-I-A, um, which President Obama signed this into law in 2004. So what this did was place an extra emphasis on services to transition youth. Um, the act endeavors to prioritize transition um, services to youth as they are the future of our workforce. So with that in mind, um, 
WIOA stipulates uh, several things. Um, I want to, you know, really highlight um, the mandate that state VR agencies set aside at least 15% of their federal dollar for the provision of pre-employment transition services, which we'll talk about um, what they are in the next slide. It also allows for support um, for advanced education and training in STEM fields and other technical professions. And it dedicates half of the supported, program, supported employment program to serve youth with the most significant disability so that they can obtain and maintain competitive integrated employment. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. So, um, like I mentioned before, um, provision of pre-employment transition services, or pre ed um, as they are referred to, um, there are five mandatory um, services that states must provide, and those are job exploration counseling, work-based learning experiences, counseling regarding post-secondary education programs, workplace readiness training, and this includes social and independent living skills, and also instruction in self-advocacy. So again, um, WIOA um, mandates that state VR agencies set aside 15% um, of their federal budget, which is a significant amount, to provide these services to students or youth with disabilities while they're still in high school. And I will now, I'll turn it back over to Diane so she can resume. Thank you, Ron. I thought that was great. Thanks so much. Okay, moving right along. Many of you will not be involved in this, but you might be, through, especially through Indicator 13 and 14. But just as there's accountability systems for you as educators or administrators, the state also has to show its accountability um, in the progress it makes in special education for each particular state. So every year, each state must complete an annual state performance plan or SPP. There are 20 indicators that the um, individuals who work at state departments must complete using measured instruments, using the data that they have. In transition, we are, we are responsible for the data in four indicators. Indicator one, what are the graduation rates within the state and have these improved for students with disabilities? Indicator two, what are the dropout rates and have the dropout rates uh, percentage-wise for youth who receive IEPs have those lessened, that is the hope. Indicator 13, which is, are we developing transition plans that, have, that are comprehensive in nature, that include coordinated, measurable annual goals and transition services that enable students to meet their post-secondary goals? And finally, indicator 14, which is fo the follow-along indicator, what is happening a year after a student exits school. And so when you are in your own particular position, chances are you will run across collection of data for one of these four indicators. Let's look at indicator 13 quickly, because these are the, this is probably the one in which you will be involved, in which you will be involved the most often, which is to ensure that you are writing good transition-focused IEPs. I want you to look down at the highlighted words that I've put here, because all of these are components of Indicator 13 for which you will be monitored as an educator. So, are there appropriate measurable post-secondary goals? Are they updated annually? Are there appropriate formal and informal transition assessments, you need to have both. Are, they, are the transition services smart? Do they enable that particular student 
to reach, to be able to reasonably meet those post-secondary goals? And are there annual IEP goals? Was there evidence student was invited to the IEP? Remember, they don't have to participate, but they do have to be invited. And if appropriate, is there evidence uh, that a participating agency was at least invited to the IEP meeting? So big shoes to fill for each of you as an educator. Here's the transition planning process um, as we see it. And this is where that coordinated set of activities come in because you want this coordinated throughout the process. Number one, you start, and I love in Colorado that we start the IEP process asking the student, what are your strengths, interests, and needs? What do you want? Then we go to providing formal and informal assessments. We then from there ascertain student needs. We identify measurable post-school goals. We identify the um, objectives that go with those particular goals. And we write a wonderful comprehensive IEP. Any one of those that is left out will mean that you haven't done that coordinated set of activities that our students deserve. And we do that in part through a sort of a global way of looking at transition programming. Paula Kohler back in 1996 uh, did a very data-driven policy uh, document, book actually, called The Taxonomy for Transition Programming, which we used, many of us, myself included, as a Bible for 20 years. We now have the second iteration of that, Taxonomy for Transition Programming 2.0, and you can see it's not that much different, but you can see that there are five areas in, that, in which we need to be thinking about how to provide uh, not just adequate, but comprehensive transition services. For those of you who go to the CBI, you know that this is part of your assessment process as you write your plans for the following year and which areas are you going to concentrate on within that. And finally, three other areas that I want to touch on. These areas are courses unto themselves. They are master's degrees unto themselves. But it's really important that we understand that self-determination of students is at the root of everything that we do. The more that we can have students um, provide their own voices into the system, the stronger all of our transition services are going to be. So the way that we do that is we cannot assume that students will know how to be self-determined. Indeed, we must explicitly teach them the knowledge and skills to be able to do that and practice it with them and role play it with them and provide opportunities for them to practice self-determination. There are so many great curricula out there that really um, mirror what I'm talking about. So I encourage you to find them and to help your students to become much more self-determined. You can see the list here of setting goals, solving problems, making choices, participating, advocating, and so on. And finally, the other two areas are making sure that we have engaged our families, and that we provide the attention and the respect to cultural considerations that need to be honored. I guess if I had, I have uh, lived and worked in Alaska, in Colorado, in New Mexico with a variety of diverse groups. And if I had to say one thing about cultural consideration, it would be be quiet, be quiet and just listen. Listen to what individuals have to say coming from their own cultural milieu. The same is true for families. Ask them first before we start talking and hopefully you'll gain some really good information that way. If you have a lot of questions? I hope so. I hope this has spurred you on to ask a lot of questions to go to the NTECT website 
and to um, pursue further education. I um, know this was very basic, but I hope you got something out of it. So thank you very, very much and best of luck to all of you. Thank you so much, Diane. There have been um, a lot of great questions and a lot of them you answered throughout your presentation and they were no longer applicable. But as you said, um, a lot of them can be answered um, from our, our website at transitionta.org. And also, if you have a specific question relative to a context within your state, um, I know there were several of them, um, you can reach out to Intact via our website, um, a scroll to the bottom, and there is a way to contact us. It's um, at our email at intactmail at uncc.edu. Um, um, and we will connect you with a technical assistance provider that can support you and um, helping you achieve, um, answer your questions or provide some technical assistance around your needs. Um, we are, um, it is the right at the top of the hour, which is the end of our webinar. So we appreciate everyone. I've provided a link um, to the evaluation. Intact takes these data um, very seriously to provide you quality technical assistance. And so we use these data, so please fill it out. Um, you'll also receive it um, 24 hours from now in an email, but oftentimes, if you're like me, a day later, I will not have time to fill out the evaluation, so do it now. Again, thank you for um, all your participation, and next month's webinar will be on resources for teachers and VR counselors relative to providing services to um, youth and young adults with um, traumatic brain injuries. So we hope to see you all there and you can register um, on our website at the same place you registered for this one. And Diane, thank you so much. You are such a wealth well. of information and um, provide such a great historical um, perspective. Um, so appreciated. So um, thank you all and we're signing off. I usually wait a couple of minutes before that I stop recording. That's what I do need to do. Um, That's fine. Then.